I shouldn't be here. But when I committed my life to Jesus Christ as a teenager, he joined my stammering tongue and gave me the privilege of being here. So if you want to see Elohim, draw near to Jehovah, submit to Adonai, and watch him blow your mind. In this session, we're going to look at the names Jehovah and Adonai. Jehovah is the self-revealing God. It's when he discloses himself to you so that you come to see something about him that relates to your everyday existence and everyday life. That's why Jehovah is coupled so much in the Bible to other names. We're going to look at some of those names. It comes right on the heels of Elohim. Elohim is the powerful God. We've looked at that. Jehovah is the self-revealing God. God wants you to see his power in the context of a relationship. He wants to reveal himself to you. Adonai, well, that's the master. That's the ruler. He wants to have the final say-so in your life. He wants to rule you. When you get those working for you, the powerful God who has a relationship, Jehovah, who now has the say-so over your life, Adonai, you've come to know God. You're coming to be transformed by that knowledge. Welcome to the great Jehovah, who also wants to be your Adonai. A teacher gave her classroom an assignment to draw a picture of something that was important to them. She began to walk around the classroom and came upon one of her students and uh, ask him, well, what's your picture? He says, I'm drawing a picture of God. He says, what? She says, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, well, you, you can't do that because nobody knows what God looks like. Student said, they will when I get finished. <laughs> Everybody has a concept of God, but any picture you come up with on your own, it's going to be a bad photograph. Right. Remember those old photographs in the malls where you walk in the little booth behind the curtain, yes. put in your money, yes. sit down, yes. it takes a picture and then pumps out like four copies. Don't show those to nobody. <laughs> God would not allow man to make a graven image of him. Thou shalt not make any graven image. Because any picture you come up with is going to be a bad photograph. If you really want to know who God is and what he looks like, one of the best ways to do that is by understanding his names. And God has a name that relates to our reality. We say God, but that encompasses so many aspects of this awesome person. We've already looked at Elohim. Uh, but in this session, we want to look at two other names for God. I call them core names. Elohim is a core name. Today, Jehovah Amen. and Adonai. Amen. Jehovah comes out of a situation. In fact, most of God's names in Scripture come out of scenarios in which God reveals himself in the realities of where people are. Yes. One of the best ways to discover God's name is to need him. Amen. Because then he reveals something about himself that you would not otherwise know experientially. Because he wants us to experience his name, not just be able to recite it. So that we have a a great, great picture of who he is. Moses saw a bush that wouldn't burn. That's a contradiction. When you've got a bush on fire, it's supposed to be burning, but he finds this bush is staying green, even though it's engulfed in flames. He turns and responds to the contradiction. When he turns and responds to the contradiction, a voice comes out of the flame and says, 
Moses, Moses, watch out whenever God calls your name twice. <laughs> Moses, Moses, take off your shoes. You on holy ground. Uh, I'm here now. Then God wants Moses to do a mighty task. He wants him to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Now Moses' mama didn't raise a dummy. He said, now they messed up 40 years ago. I've been out here learning my lesson for 40 years. And now you want to send me back to the people I've been running from to tell them to let the people go who I tried to get let go that got me in trouble in the first place. So uh, I have, well, you and I have to have a talk. I don't know if you've ever had to have a conversation with God because he doesn't make sense right now. Uh, well, watch out when God doesn't make sense in the circumstances of life because he can show you something new about him you've never seen before. So Moses enters a, into a dialogue with God in Exodus chapter 3. God says, I will send you to Pharaoh, verse 10 that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt and you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, behold, I am going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Now I'm going out here, God, and telling them, the God of our forefathers sent me to you to lead you out of here. You know what I'm going to look like to them people? <laughs> and they're going to want to know, who is this God who told you to do this? So I need to know who you are by you telling me your name. Amen. Amen. Then God responds to Moses. I am, verse 14, who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am sent me to you. Now I know what you're thinking. What kind of name is that? <laughs> Moses says, what's your name? God says, I am that I am is my name. Now this phrase was a sacred phrase to the Jews. It was made up of four consonants. These four letters that could not be pronounced without vowels. The sacred name of God. When vowels were added to it so it was made pronounceable, the four letters became Yahweh. When Yahweh gets translated into English, it's Jehovah. So Jehovah is the English translation of the Hebrew Yahweh, which is the name God gave to himself with the four letters that couldn't be pronounced without vowels. So whenever you say Jehovah, you're referring to Yahweh, which are vowels placed with the, with the consonants that are in verse 14 when he tells Moses who he is. He says, I am that I am. The reason why Jehovah, Yahweh, is such a sacred name is because it is the name he gave himself. Not the name that somebody else gave him or recognized. He says, this is my name. And my name is, I am which means Jehovah. Why is this name significant? What makes this name so special? In fact, let me go a little deeper. What makes this God's favorite name? This name is used almost 7,000 times in the Old Testament to define who God is. You may say, but how do I know when I'm seeing that name? Well, you can know it. Because when you pick up your English Bible, you will see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When the, all four letters are capitalized in your English Bible, that is normally going to refer to Jehovah. 
as opposed to when you see capital L, small o, small r, small d. Because that will refer to the name I'm going to address in a moment, Adonai. So even your English Bible attempts, since both are referring to God, to help us to understand the distinction through the capitalization process that you wouldn't normally see just by reading the English Bible and not knowing the various Hebrew words. He says, you tell them I am have sent you. Now, that may not seem like much of a name, but this name of God, you really need to know because it is the name God uses when he wants to reveal himself to you. Elohim, he wants to show you his muscles. That's his strength. Jehovah, he wants to get closer to you in a relationship. And so Jehovah means we want a relationship. That's why he tells Moses, you tell them that I am, that I am has sent you. So let's talk about this name, this I am name. I am that I am is no small thing. First of all, you can't say it. I can't say it. No human being can say, I am that I am. Because you are because you were created. Okay? I am that I am brings together five concepts just in that phrase, I am that I am. First of all, it is the concept of self-sufficiency. In other words, because God exists, I am, because God exists, that I am, that means God doesn't have to go outside of himself to exist. In other words, he is sufficient within himself. He doesn't have to go to the store to buy food. He doesn't have to drive a car to go somewhere because all he needs is within himself. The sun doesn't have to find fire to stay hot because it's self-sufficient with flame. In other words, the flame to keep it hot is already inside of it. And all it is doing is rotating its already existence. When God says, I am that I am, he's saying he is sufficient and therefore has no need to go outside of himself for anything. When I am need something, I am goes to I am. Because I am that I am. So whatever I am wants or needs, not that he needs anything, but if he were to need something, I am would just go to I am. And that's why the, the, the issue is, uh, you know, am I a man, God says, that, that, that I would be dependent? So number one, Jehovah, that is I am, means that our God is self-sufficient. Number two, I am means he's also self-existent. He is because he is. Now, that throws us for a curveball because none of us are self-existent. We need things in order for us to function that are outside of ourselves. We do not purely exist within ourselves. So he is that he is because he is. He doesn't have to try to be. We're always trying to be somebody, become somebody, act like somebody, not like who we are, but God is because he is, which leads to the third one. It speaks of eternality because it's present tense. Not I was, not I will be, I am. Let me tell you something about God. He has no past and he has no future. He lives in perpetuity. I like that word. Let me say that again. <laughs> he lives in perpetuity of the present tense. I am that I am. Not I was, not I will be. Everything for God is right now. Now, we can't relate to that because we have past, present, and future. So we, we were, we are, we will be. That's not God. God always exists because there is no yesterday and no tomorrow. 
He only speaks to us in those terms. It's called anthropomorphic language, speaking in terms that people can understand so he can relate to us and we can relate to him so he uses our language. But when we talk about him, he is in an eternal state and everything is now. So whenever God talks to you about something that will happen using our language, you better believe it because he's already been there and come back. He, he ain't waiting for it to happen. He's already located it and had the return trip because he ever lives in the present tense. By the way, that explains our relationship in eternity with Jehovah. Because when we hit eternity, there is no night. Remember, there's no night in heaven, okay? Everything is perpetual sunlight and perpetual uh, a daylight with no clock. Now, if you lived with no clock and no night, you would never know the time. Because remember when Elohim created, evening and morning became the first day. Darkness and light allowed you and allows us to have time. The reason you're going to be in eternity is there will be no measurement of time. I am is inviting us into his I amness. We will be with the I am being I am because he's going to cast away the darkness. And in fact, he says he himself will be the sun. Okay. Because God is in an eternal state. That's why the Bible talks about the immutability of God. That he does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is what he was in our view and will be in our view. He has always been and always will be. Well, you may raise the question, but wait a minute. Uh, I, I, I see times in the Bible where men change. I read times in the Bible where it says God repented. Well, if you read times in the Bible where men changed, all he did was an, adjust one of his attributes to our change. Like in Nineveh, it says God repented. He changed his mind. But how can he change if he's the changeless God? Changeless God, because they changed in their relationship to him. So when you change, he just adjusts something that's already always been true of him to your adjustment. So don't think it's God's changing. It's you changing and God being consistent with your change because he is the immutable God. But he's also, as we've already indicated, personal because he says, I am personal God. He's a personal God that wants to walk with you and talk with you. Here God gives his major name, his most personal name, and he says, I am. That tells us that this God is also self-defined. He's self-defined. I am that I am means I am not what you want me to be. Let me tell you about me. You, you ever have people in your life who want to tell you about you? You know, they don't know that much about you. But they want to tell you about you. And you have to sit them down and say, especially when it's your children, you got to sit them down. You know, they talking about, I think. You ain't been around here long enough to think. But here, mere creations of God want to dictate to him. He says, no, I am that I am. I'm going to define this thing. When you and I get to live with the I am, Jehovah, forever, he is so inexhaustible because he's eternal and self-generating that it will take eternity to fully discover him. The reason you're going to have to live forever is because it's going to take that long. Because he is the infinite eternal God and you in fact there's going to be so much to learn about God that God is canceling night so that you don't sleep and miss nothing <laughs> he's going to give you a brand new body 
so that you won't even get tired and need to take a break. So that there will be the nonstop, here's the description of heaven, nothing boring about it. Heaven is the nonstop, uninterrupted, no commercials, knowledge of God. It's where God gets to show off 24 hours a day, even though there is no day, so you can get to know him better. And his name is Jehovah, Yahweh, the four letters that cannot be pronounced. And he teaches us this name through the intersections of life. In fact, if you go back to Genesis, we see God combining this name with Elohim. He combines it with Elohim because beginning in verse 4, you see the Lord God. All the way, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God, the Lord God. Why does he now add Yahweh to Elohim? God, Elohim, Lord, Yahweh, he combines the two. Why does he now combine the two? Because you can't get God's power until you have God's relationship. See, a lot of people want Elohim, but they don't want Jehovah. But if you want to experience Elohim, you got to draw near to Jehovah. So that's why in Genesis chapter 3, when Satan talks to Eve, he says, hath God said. He leads off Jehovah and only wants to discuss Elohim because he doesn't mind religion as long as there's no relationship. Because he knows if there's no relationship, there'll be no power. So that's why to get more of Elohim, don't go Elohim hunting, go Jehovah hunting, because Jehovah will bring in Elohim. The Lord God. Don't let Satan get Jehovah out of the equation. Adonai. Adonai, capital L, small O, small O, small R, small D, typically in the New Testament. It refers to the master or the ruler the one who is in charge. When this name comes up, it is calling you to submission to Jehovah. Watch this. Elohim is the power. Jehovah is the relationship. Adonai is positioning yourself under Jehovah so you can experience Elohim. It is yielding to God as master. God is said in scripture to be the Adonai, Psalm 97 verse 5, of the whole earth. He's the master and ruler of the whole earth. This belongs to God. Amen. He's the ruler. Amen. He's in charge. But when you start driving your life your own way and going by your own rules, you're jeopardizing the relationship so that you're losing out on experiencing more of Elohim. He wants you to recognize and submit to him as master. That's why when Moses recognized him as Adonai in chapter 4, verses 10 to 13 in the book of Exodus, then God began to lead him in victory over Pharaoh. He said, my name is Jehovah in chapter 3. Moses recognizes him as Adonai in chapter 4 so that now the power of God is experienced when it comes to setting God's people free. When Isaiah, you remember Isaiah chapter 6? Isaiah chapter 6 says that in the king, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw the capital O, capital L, small O, small R, small D. The Hebrew word there is Adonai. Why? Because he's comparing it with a ruling king who died and the ruling king who's still alive. He wants you to know that you submit to this king no matter what's happening to the kings around you. Because when you submit to Adonai, you experience more of Jehovah so that you can uh, piggyback on the power of Elohim. You know, in, in courts, on TV, you know, Judge Judy and Judge Brown and, you know, they've got these judges. And they have people who come in. I don't know where they get these people from. But they get, you know, they get people who come in to try their cases before the court judge. Now, before you can get on that show, you must agree to something in advance. You must agree that whatever the judge says is the final decision. That the judge's ruling you must submit to or they will not hear your case 
and you won't be on television. <laughs> See, a lot of us want to get God's ruling to decide if we're going to submit. That's called backwards Christian soldiers. You don't get his uh, ruling and then make your decision. He says, you call me Lord and let me render my decision. But when I render my decision because you've come under and submitted to Adonai, then the result will be you'll get more of Jehovah so that you can experience the power of Elohim. The problem is we don't want full-time submission. We got a lot of folks, even Christians, who want full-time blessing while they have part-time commitment. It's like the story of the chicken and the pig. We're walking down the street and they came across a sign that said bacon and eggs desperately needed in the window of a grocery store. The chicken looked at the pig and said, the grocer needs some bacon and the grocer needs some eggs. Let's help the grocer. I give them the eggs, you give them the bacon. Pig said, you got to be out of your mind. Chicken said, what's the problem? He said, the problem is real simple. For you, it's a contribution. For me, it's the whole thing. See, a lot of us want to give a God an egg here and an egg there. He an egg there, an egg everywhere, an egg, egg, when he want pork chops, ham hocks, chitlins. No, he wants the whole thing. He wants us to fully submit to who he is. In fact, in Moses' case, when he called God Adonai, he says, I can't speak, I stutter. But he called God Adonai, and then God says, I got your tongue. Amen. Now that you've submitted to me, I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing here today preaching. Many people don't know that as a kid growing up, I had to go to special classes because I st 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 stuttered when I spoke, and I couldn't hardly finish a sentence. I shouldn't be here, but when I committed my life to Jesus Christ as a teenager, he joined my stammering tongue and gave me the privilege of being here. So if you want to see Elohim, draw near to Jehovah, submit to Adonai, and watch him blow your mind. Well, now you know a little bit more about Jehovah. <laughs> you know about this uh, covenantal name of God. And we want to get you more information on the names of God. Knowing God's Names, part one, is a CD series that's available for you right now. You can contact us here at The Urban Alternative at 1-800-800-3222 or log on to TonyEvans.org and get for a gift of any amount to our ministry, Knowing God's Names, part one. Would you be as generous as you can? Because we want not only to get this truth to you, but we want to continue our ministry so that we can continue bringing God's word into your life and to the lives of thousands of others throughout our nation and around the world. And your support, your generous support will help us to do that effectively. God bless you richly. Can't wait to be with you again next time. Mm -hmm.